Hello and welcome again to my model railroad. In this video, which I recorded last night at something like 2 a.m., I started painting up one of my locomotives to represent a long lost Norfolk and Western steam locomotive. This probably won't surprise many of you, but I really, really like the look of late 19th and early 20th century steam locomotives, because this is when they retained all the shiny brass bits of the earlier locomotives, but they started to get bigger and more mechanically interesting. I'm not gonna lie, locomotives from that point in time were kinda awkward to work on. They weren't quite ergonomically uh, conscious yet, but they were very shiny and very pretty, and I really like them. So in this video, we're going to be painting up a locomotive to represent a long-lost Norfolk and Western Railway C-Class 460. There are two pictures of this locomotive that I've been able to find, and it looks kinda like one of the ATO trains that I already have. Anyways, let's get moving. We're off schedule! Now since that will probably be a longer project, I've set that aside for the time being because this is actually the main event of this evening, if you will. This is my Mantua 460. This is a pretty simple little locomotive. Um, it is very sensitive to poorly laid track, like the temporary setup that I have right now, so it does tend to derail this, uh, this middle uh, flangeless wheel tends to you know, dive in where it shouldn't in gaps and so on, and it sort of derails the whole thing. Um, but other than that, it actually does run surprisingly smoothly. Uh, considering how old this locomotive is, you know, the fact that they can, you know, crawl along like that is pretty impressive, if you ask me. But we're not talking about the mechanics of it right now because um, I actually did manage to get the. The only reason that this thing runs now and uh, it didn't beforehand was because the uh, wheels on the tender truck were uh, rusted to the point where they weren't collecting power. Uh, for those of you that don't own locomotives like this, a lot of the Mantua engines, um, they pick up half of their electric power from one side of the tender wheels and one side of the uh, engine wheels. And uh, that's why there's the wire between them. And um, yeah, the, so the wheels on this tender truck, these tender trucks were really, really badly rusted. And the screws were in such a state that I can't actually be, like undo them on this tender. They're that solidly in place, which is annoying because I can't adjust the drawbar. Um, but yeah, I, in a desperate attempt, just sort of puffed a little bit of WD-40 in there and um, it runs just fine. I cleaned off most of the residue, of course, because that's the one downside to, well, the big downside to WD-40 with anything as sensitive as model trains is that it attracts a lot of dirt to get stuck in, and that's why we, I don't tend to use it as a lubricant or anything. I only use it in dire situations where something is so rusted that nothing else will do it. Anyways, the uh, plan for this locomotive is to be painting it. Now, I've made a couple modifications to this already that I'd like to uh, highlight. Uh, for a start, when I bought this engine, there was no top to the tender whatsoever, which I thought was actually quite nice because it meant that I could make my own. And I, I've just done that. Um, something that I've added this evening on top of this new cardstock tender um, roof, I guess you could call it a roof, is a pair of toolbo uh, toolbox um, thing on the side because the engine that I'm specifically modifying this to resemble had this very big toolbox that went off to the side here next to the coal pile. And I also added in a, a water filler cap. Um, it's actually kind of funny how I made these. These are actually um, a couple of spare Lego bricks that I had lying around, you know, the plates. And, you know, they're smooth surfaces and they've got that very nice little bit of ridge around them for the toolbox and the tank lid. And I just took little bits of cardstock as I usually do, and I just sort of made little hinges for them. And um, I was very surprised with how convincing and um, scale these look. And, uh, yeah. Now, the one thing that you guys will probably be um, asking about is, um, why isn't there a hole for the coal, coal bin, you know, down in here? And the answer to that is the engine that I'm modeling this off of, which is the Norfolk and Western C-Class, um, in the two existing photographs that I could find of this engine, both of them had a really, really big coal pile on the tender. 
uh, because these were used on the very mountainous Norfolk and Western Railroad. And um, I guess it makes sense, you know, if you're, you know, running up through the mountains and you're hauling heavy trains, especially, you know, trains of coal and so on, and, you know, you're climbing up the Appalachian Mountains, the last thing you want to have happen is to run out of coal somewhere on the line. So, you know, I, I guess if it wouldn't hurt to take some extra with you. Especially considering that, you know, if the tunnels are big enough for something with as tall of a chimney as this, you know, a big tall coal load kind of makes sense. That, and I thought the picture itself was just kind of funny because there was like, um, it was a pretty intense coal pile. Like, they had an extra backup light here, and the coal pile was taller than the backup light, and it was a little bit, just a little bit 19th century and weird, which is what I always live for. But, anyways, I'm, in terms of paint for this locomotive, I'm not really going to be doing anything too fancy. I'm probably just going to be painting it mostly black. I might leave some bits like the headlight in red, just because I, I can't resist the red. And um, the boiler itself, I may paint into a more um, brush iron, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell what color it actually is in the picture, but I'm assuming it's just black, but like, you know... There's nobody that's alive from 1905 or whatever that can tell me that it's wrong if, you know, I decided to make it gray or something. And plus, it's, you know, it's an HO train. It's not the end of the world if the colors aren't right. Now, in terms of paint for this session, I'm probably just going to be using mostly black because really I'm not going to be painting too many accent parts on this engine because it's more of a freight locomotive. And, um, you know, I've... I want to have a bunch of these uh, Victorian era locomotives and I kind of want this to sort of contrast with some of the more intricate ones because it's, you know, more for freight trains and so on. So, uh, the headlight may be red, maybe. Uh, the outline of the windows might be red. But uh, for the most part, it'll be black with the uh, very fancy um, pre-1910, I think, Norfolk Western font. Up we come and there we are. Now, normally on most of my model trains, I tend to use brush painting, just because I'm a little bit more comfortable with it. And um, yeah, these acrylics are um, at my uh, pl uh, campus supply store, and, um, you know, I mean, technically, you know, it's a project. It's just not a, an academic one, per se. But I don't think the supply store people mind. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, though, as I'm painting this, as much as I would love to uncouple the tender completely so that I can move things around a little bit more freely. Unfortunately, none of the screws on this thing will budge, even though I've used very harsh chemicals on this that would not normally be uh, suitable for model train usage, and these screws still will not come out. So, um, yeah, they're just going to be a uh, they're just going to be together during this and um, unhooking the drop and. Uh, since I'm kind of stalling right now, there's one last thing that I got to do before I start painting, and that's get some of this dust off the model. Now, to do that, I've got this toothbrush, which I uh, do not plan on using afterwards, and uh, it does a pretty good job of getting all the uh, dust out from the detailed bits without actually damaging anything. So, like, you know, riveted bits of uh, you know, the cab and so on. Now one of the interesting things about a lot of these Mantua engines is that the motor actually is underneath the firebox and usually they have this little cover piece that sort of looks like a boiler backhead. It's actually quite a neat little detail and I think um, it's very very simple but I think I could put some more gauges and you know suggestions of handles and so on on it to make it look a little more detailed because unlike the 578 cab which um, is mostly obscured by the tender, this tender being a lot lower and just the overall shape of this cab kind of leads the eye into the cab a little bit more and uh, you know, it makes the motor a little bit more noticeable. I probably won't cover it fully just because I do like the um, easy access to the motor when you pop this off for you know cleaning, up, uh, cleaning things off and so on, but yeah. Anyways, that's uh, en enough chatting for a little bit. I'm just going to get ready to start painting this. Alright, and... Uh into the acrylics we go. Actually using the fact that there's a little bit of water left on this to 
get a really thin little coat in there at first because uh, this brush is a little bit on the uh, stiff side. This is actually more of a wash. This is actually a decent sort of weathering attempt almost. And it's just a start. Cool. But no matter what I do, and uh, you know this, uh, there's probably better ways of doing what I'm doing right now. But at the same time, it is just a bit of fun. So we'll probably take uh, one or two coats to cover the the um, all the red, but it should look decent when it's done, especially when I put the uh, lettering and so on on the tender. So that's something I've noticed is a lot of older um, brass locomotives, you know, like kit-built things, tended to be brush-painted, and I don't know, there's just something kind of charming about them. Because, yeah, they're not exactly the most scale prototypical things in the world, but, you know, there's just a little bit of sort of a feeling of craftsmanship in it, and uh, I kind of admire that. I don't know. Now around the toolbox I'm actually going pretty thick intentionally because in the pictures it looked to be made of wood. And one of the nice things about brush, brush um, streaks is that they do kind of resemble uh, painted wood sometimes if the streaks are real thick. Uh, it's kind of hard to catch on the camera, but when the lighting hits it a certain way it just kind of has that um, sort of grain effect. And uh, it's not really desired on a lot of metal things and you know that's one of the downsides of the you know, the, the finish, but at the same time, I don't know, I just, I kind of like it. So here's one side of the tender. This is just the first coat, so a lot of the streaking looks worse than it really is. Um, yeah. And then the uh, top of the tender. I'm, one of the things that I love about painting up uh, slightly modified engines is the way that the paint, that paint just sort of blends together materials. So like, you know, these you know, that water tank cap and this toolbox, they suddenly look like they were supposed to be there the whole time, even though I just sort of, you know, stuck them on. And, uh, yeah, I'm having a pretty fun time with this so far, and, uh, while that's drawing, I'll probably move on to the, uh, locomotive next. Okay, so I've just gone and done the, uh, first coat on the other side of the tender. Still a bit light in a few places, and I'll probably go over it a second or third time, just to make sure it's all black. But... I'm, I'm quite happy with it, especially the way that these uh, toolboxes and the uh, water cap are sort of blending in. And uh, hopefully it'll look better once it's sort of more smoothed out. Um, now onto the cab, and our very light wash of paint here um, didn't really do the trick, did it? So uh, yeah, we'll go over it again. Alright, so I've started doing the cab. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting with a lot of Mantua Tyco locomotives is that the cab kind of just... Uh, slots onto the boiler. Now annoyingly these brass handrails will not let go of the cab so I can't just completely take it off right now but I'd very much like to if I could. Um, hopefully these handrails aren't being too well bent by this but um, yeah it's making painting a lot easier because now I can just sort of reach into all the uh, little nicks and crannies especially around the front of the cab uh, which I haven't started yet but uh, you know because now I can sort of, you know, sh uh, shift the cab around a little bit. And I guess it doesn't really matter if I get a little bit of uh, excess on the locomotive boiler itself, because I'm probably going to paint that a different color anyways, but, you know, it's just nice that I can uh, access parts like this for uh, painting purposes. I'll also try to keep these uh, cab windows slash doors at the front free from paint, because I do like them in red. Um, I might just sort of touch them up a little bit, too, and make them a different shade of red if I end up getting too much paint on them, but we'll see how it goes. Okay, so I've gotten a lot of black paint in where I initially didn't want it, but eh, I kind of like the whole cabin black. I might might trim some of these with a really fine brush, but for now I think it looks pretty good. It's really starting to uh, look at the part of a you know, early 20th century freight locomotive. All it's left to do now is uh, some of the touch-ups on this cab and uh, the other side, and then we can go down to the boiler. Although I do want to paint the inside of the cab uh, green if I can.
if uh, the handrails will come off and let me do that. Well, that's the other side of the cab done. Uh, I'll probably touch it up a little bit more, but for the time being, I think I will just slot it back on the engine so that the handrails don't get bent out of shape. Um, now, it's not totally dry yet, and I know I shouldn't, but... Okay. And now to clean up the fingerprints from the roof, because... I should have waited, but you know what? That was going to bother me if I didn't. And, uh... Yeah. Got to remove my fingerprints from the engine's roof now, because, uh... You know, some weirdo could use that to, uh... access my bank account or something. I don't know. There. And, uh, there we go. I've eradicated all the evidence of, uh, me tampering with the roof of the cab with the wet paint. Right. Now there's not really much else left to do on this other than the uh, middle parts of the domes because I want to leave a little bit of the brass around the edges because, you know, it's real brass and, you know, I just love that. Um, I'll probably leave the headlight alone, maybe. I might paint it black, might not. I'm not really sure. Uh, and then the pilot beam will probably be black next. And uh, the tops of the running boards probably, they might, I might do wood texture for them. Might do wood, uh, white trim, we'll see. And then the boiler's gonna probably be either gray or black. Now in order to uh, paint some of the bits around the domes, I'm gonna be using this much finer brush. Uh, this brush is approximately the width of 20 human nose hairs stuck together. And, um, yeah, we're just gonna be painting the middle bit there, and maybe the top part of this dome. I want most. Of the, I want some of the brass to show through, but not quite all of it. Now, painting brass is kind of tricky because, by the nature of the metal, it doesn't really stick to paint very well. But that's the first of the domes, and uh, yeah, there. So yeah, I'll just um, repeat this process on the second one, and. Um, yeah, I really like that look. The trick with the second one, though, is that it's very close to the, uh, the front of the cab, and I can't really get the cab completely off. So it'll be a bit touch-and-go to actually uh, get paint around the whole thing, but, I mean, at the same time, if the back of the dome is messy, it's not like anybody's going to ever really, you know, see it. But, yeah. I also got a little smudge of it around the edge of the dome there that'll probably scrape off so that the... Uh, shiny rim bit sticks through. So there's a few spots that are a bit um, that sort of went over, but I, other than that I'm pretty happy with the, uh, the look of those domes. Just adding that little strip of paint around the edge has made a lot of difference and it's made these look just that little bit more uh, finely detailed. Just notice the spot that I missed on the uh, cab there. But yeah, this is really starting to look uh, quite fancy and early uh, 20th century. It's just, I, I quite like it. So I don't know how many of you folks have uh, seen this uh, particular television show, but whenever I look at this locomotive, it makes me think of the 1950s Casey Jones uh, show. Recently, I was re-watching it while I was uh, drawing, just as something to put in the background, you know. And, um, you know, I was really thinking about how a modern interpretation of the show would be, because I do quite like it for 19... Uh, as 1950s uh, TV shows go, it's it's quite nice. As, uh, it's it's not really um, too high stakes or anything most of the time. It's you're pretty typical sort of Western, but the uh, difference being that the train stuff takes center stage, and quite ironically, a lot of the background of throwaway characters seem more like... Um, if it was a show like Gunsmoke, you know, they would be like a major character. Like, um, you know, there was an episode where they were delivering explosives and, um, you know, these two, you know, rough and tumble cowboy type guys, you know, they just sort of show up as part of a B the B plot and they just sort of have their own 
cowboy style tussle and the plot really doesn't pay much attention to him and um, it's also quite satisfying to see you know the typical train robbery dynamic kind of reversed by um, Casey Jones also having a gun and uh, s so on and so forth it's an interesting watch um, I think a modern in interpretation of though would actually be quite interesting because the, the locomotive in the show um, Sierra Railroad number no. three also known as the train in every other movie, um, it still runs, and, you know, I think, considering that they painted it up as the uh, Back to the Future engine again for an event, I don't, I think they would be more than happy to show off their locomotive in a, like a Netflix miniseries or something. Um, the one thing that I thought was interesting, but kind of a little bit underwhelming about the Casey Jones show is that it doesn't actually stick that close to the background of, you know, the real Casey Jones. Which is a shame, because if I recall, the uh, the fireman, uh, Sam Webb, I think he was alive at least into the early 1950s. I don't know if he was around in 58, but I know he was around alive at that point in time. And I think he would have been an interesting consultant for the show, because, you know, he was actually there and he knew the man. So, I don't know, there might be some interesting nuances that you know, they kind of missed um, but yeah, it's a pretty average sort of western-y type thing. And uh, in that show, I I really like the conductor character. He's he's kind of so there's there's a couple different types of railroad conductor in media. Um, there's sort of a spectrum. Um, Ernest Borgnine spec is the um, hardcore conductor, and um, like hardcore freight conductor. And then Tom Hanks conductor is hardcore passenger conductor, and um, this guy is kind of very squarely in the middle because he's got the Ernest Borgnine rulebook type authority, but he's actually decent with people, unlike Ernest Borgnine conductor, who's you know a little bit violent, you could say, and uh, you know it, he doesn't like uh, people riding his train, so I don't know what would happen if uh, Emperor of the North's conductor was on a, a passenger train, like if he and Tom Hanks swapped roles, that would just be, that'd actually be a great horror film. Polar Express 2, but Emperor of the North conductor. So right now I'm just using this uh, real thin brush to go in and uh, fill in a lot of the little gaps that I couldn't reach with the big brush. A lot of these are things like the, uh, the back of the toolbox, you know, where it sort of meets the lip of the tender and then also some of the bits just along the uh, the edge here like there's a little bit of red poking through that I'm not even sure if the camera can really see but yeah and give the edge of the running board a little bit of a trim um, however I do want to paint the underside of this um, assembly black because that's you know this bit wouldn't really be all that shiny because that's like you know the um, sort of attempt at modeling the brake rigging, except it's not connected to anything. And um, this whole area underneath the locomotive just doesn't really look all that great, so I'm probably going to paint it black so that it sort of blends into the uh, the running gear a little bit better. I'll also probably be painting the wheel centers of this black, like the little brass bits that stick out. And um, I might actually try to do white walls and uh, white painted rods on this, just to make them pop a little more. Because that's one of the really um, characteristic things about Sierra Railway Number no. Three, and one of the reason the reason I think it's used in so many westerns is that it's a fairly was a fairly modern locomotive, you know, 1905, but it's got this you know this sort of long gap with the driving wheels and the long rods that you can uh, just about imagine somebody Buster Keaton sitting on, you know, that sort of bit of movement. It's kind of hard to describe, but I sort of liken it more towards um, uh, character walk cycles, if that makes any sense. Like with steam engines in general, the uh, size of the wheels and the rods and so on, they sort of give part of the personality. So for example, uh, something like this Great Western uh, Castle class, when it's going along, the reason it looks so grand and so on is because the wheels are so big and the most of the valve gear is tucked away out of sight. So as it's moving along, you know, it's just got this kind of gentle trotting sort of motion. Uh, meanwhile, something like, you know, this, 
going along. It's sort of got a more stocky, um, bulky sort of look because these wheels are going around a lot faster and there's more rods out and about that are sort of flailing along. And um, yeah, that sort of applies to this too. This sort of has more of the um, you know, almost sort of cowboy walk that I would describe a lot of 19th century engines having because you know there's that long gap with the rods and it sort of it looks like it's kind of stomping its way along and you know that's the kind of look you want for a western film. Alright so the wheels are protected from the paint that I would probably inevitably end up getting on them if I was doing this the other way and now I can just sort of fill these in with a little bit of black although I might leave some of the um, silver in just to make it look a little more interesting so for example around um, you know this uh, air brake cylinder I might just do a little bit of that I think there's another one of these on the other side so I probably won't film it because it's the same process so yeah on this side of the locomotive I didn't leave the uh, little rings around the uh, air brake cylinder paint um, unpainted because um, I was kind of I kind of messed up on this side but also I don't think there's supposed to be two and I don't think there's supposed to be like one on each side like that so uh, by doing this it draws less attention to the uh, air pump itself and it also makes it look a little bit asymmetrical which always makes things look a little bit more complex than they really are I also started painting the underside of the uh, running board but it, it doesn't really matter because like nobody's ever going to see the underside of it like not even in close-up shots, unless you're doing like this kind of thing, do you really ever see the underside of locomotives under the uh, running boards, but you know, it's a nice idea. And um, yeah, there's not really much left to this, I'm just going to do the uh, little cow catcher, I'll, I might leave the headlight red just because I think it's neat. And um, yeah, I don't know, I don't think I'll do too much else to this. Okay, so just to make the uh, cow catcher a little bit easier to work with, I've just unscrewed the uh, front coupler. I'll probably put a different one, one in, like maybe a knuckle of some kind, because uh, it, it doesn't really work all that well having a front coupler on an engine with such a rigid wheelbase, but, you know, it's it's the idea that counts. And, um, yeah, I'm probably just going to paint this bit black. Um, might add a few other little bits and pieces later, but, yeah. Okay, so there's the uh, pilot beam done, and um, I'm really, really starting to like the way this is going. So, the next thing I'm probably going to do is the uh, running boards themselves, and I think I'm actually going to make the tops of the running boards more of a wood sort of color, and then paint the sides white, and then touch up anything else with black. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to have to um, expand my palette a little bit. Okay, so using this brush, which is made of approximately uh, five or six of my undeveloped mustache hairs, we're going to get a little bit of this paint, this uh, brown sort of color, and then very, very slowly and very, very gently we're going to apply it on top of the running board to make them look wood. I'm not sure if the real engine had uh, wood running boards. I don't know if anybody in, alive right now knows. Um, but at this point, it doesn't really matter to me a whole lot, just because I, I don't know, I just kind of think it would look kind of cool. Yeah, it's kind of working. This particular paint, I guess, is a bit thinner, or the uh, this kind of plastic just doesn't adhere quite as nicely as um, the red plastic did. Kind of annoying, but... Oh well, once, once it dries I should be able to have an easier time painting over top of it. So one of the things that I did paint before I uh, go into doing the running boards is this air, well, little Westinghouse pump, just because I think it's kind of an important feature on this engine, because, you know, air brakes were new at the time, and, you know, usually a locomotive air pump would just be sort of stuck on. And, you know, I kind of like to draw attention to it just because it's a little interesting detail. I also did the top of this dome in black and then left the very, very top of the sand caps um, in brass. And uh, that was actually to, to make uh, this dome, which is fully brass, stand out even more and make it look a little bit more interesting because instead of there being two big shiny domes, there's only one. I might also paint the uh, little uh, steam generator black. It's a bit of a finicky piece, but it shouldn't be too uh, difficult to do. 
And yeah, I'm definitely pretty happy with how this has come along. One thing that I will probably do is just uh, give these boiler bands absolutely tiny little bit of uh, highlight. And uh, this will probably be it for this evening, aside from getting the uh, little bits of white on this. So these boiler bands aren't the cleanest job in the world, but boy do I think they really enhance the look of this thing. Like, it's funny, with a lot of um, HO trains that a lot of the more serious modelers turn their noses up at, there actually is more detail on them than most people really would think there is. Just because a lot of it's not painted very well. Which, you know, as they are in the factory, that's not really great, but at the same time, you know, if you really wanted to make them look nice, you can just sort of pick out little bits and look at pictures of the real one and you maybe see where they had a little bit more um, finesse to them, I guess. And yet again, we're getting out another kind of paint. And uh, I'm just going to very gently do the side of this. Now, this is pretty precise, so I probably will uh, do most of this off camera. Okay, so there's the running boards picked out in white. I also did the little steps at the front of the cow catcher just to sort of um, give it a little bit of a different bit of shape language. Because something that I've noticed with locomotive paint jobs is that they affect the way that we process, we, that our eyes sort of break down the shapes of it. So, for example, because these steps are white, and even if this was not a white background, you know, our eyes would sort of see the cow catcher and then the steps as little separate bits. Uh, one of the greatest examples of that kind of um, uh, perception on locomotives has to be some of the diesel streamliners because fundamentally every single F unit diesel is the same body shell. The thing that makes them look so different is the paint jobs. So for example when we look at something like a F unit from the Santa Fe Railroad, you know the most famous ones, you know our eyes see this red section as a separate shape and then this border sort of breaks that up and makes the uh, silver body almost seem like it's a little bit thinner than the rest of it as it uh, sort of transitions into the passenger cars. And then the, uh, you know, sort of the uh, jawline of the locomotive where the uh, little logo wraps around almost um, adds more of like a car grill kind of look to it. Meanwhile, um, something like the uh, Union Pacific ones, you know, it's more of a uh, single shape throughout but it sort of uh, transitions to gray here, here, and here to sort of make this look like one shape. And uh, that also applies to the uh, this, this CSX one, um, because, you know, the uh, shape language here is that the CSX is, a, is not a very good railroad. I wasn't supposed to say that. Anyways, let's, let's, let's get back to the, the painting assignment. So, we've got the white running board. We've got the black boiler bands and the... Uh, domes picked out and lots of the other details done. There is one last thing that I want to do that's uh, quite complex and that's painting the driving rods white and maybe painting the insides of the wheel senders. I'll, I'll probably do this mostly off camera just because again it's it's a very finicky ta uh, task. So that's the wheel senders done. The paint's not sticking to it uh, very well but at least there's an attempt. Um, yeah and then the uh, I don't know, I think I might leave the rods alone. Okay, so that was another lie I painted the rods. Um, I didn't take them off the locomotive because uh, with a lot of the crank pins that I would be painting anyways, the paint will be worn off by the uh, action of actually running the locomotive. And so I just sort of painted the, uh, the bits across the middle and then some of the bearing bits, but you know, it's... The bits that I can't access are bits that you're probably not going to be able to see when it's running anyways. And you know the the wheels being the rods being painted white is just sort of there to um, sort of accentuate the sort of contrast between the, uh, the rod itself and the uh, firebox, and you know make it look a little bit more uh, a little more eye catching, I guess. And uh, the tender, from what I've seen in pictures, doesn't seem to have a uh, little bit of white around the running board like most engines that have white running boards do. So I'm going to leave that mostly alone, and that's going to get a coal load once I've. Uh, got the uh, NNW numbers and transfers uh, 
made for it, which I can't obviously do right now because this COVID-19 is kind of, you know, I kept me away from the print lab. There is one thing that is missing though, and that is a bell. Thankfully, I've got one that's just uh, sitting around. Uh, where did I put that thing? Ah ha ha, there's our bell. Now the, uh, the base of the bell is just sort of, you know, it's kind of simple, but yeah, I think it looks the part. Yep, so we've got our bell glued in. I'm not going to do much else paint-wise with the bell because I like the, uh, you know, the shininess of the thing. And uh, that about wraps it up. All I really got to do before I feel safe running this is put the crew in. Well, here is the completed article. And uh, I got to say, I am very, very pleased with the results. Um, the, the tender still needs coal and... Uh, I'm pretty sure the, the conversation between the, these two is probably going to be the, the fireman asking, you know, um, you know, could we, uh, could, could, could we pull over? We're a little low on coal. But anyways, uh, it's amazing what can be done with a lot of the uh, simpler model trains out there. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's really necessary to have the uh, high-end equipment if, you know, if you're a little bit imaginative, you can make something like this out of, you know, a pretty standard man to a Tyco engine. Actually, hang on a second. Before I end the video, you... It's, 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 it's,